Coming up on the program, global markets remain on the edge as U.S. election outcome remains uncertain. Mauritius oil spill cleanup likely to be completed by January. And global wind energy set for five years of record growth. Hello and welcome. This is Business Incorporated on Channels Television. I'm Chimeze Obi Iwago. We tee off with intraday market numbers. Here in Africa, the markets were fo are following the global trend, looking up at intraday while all eyes remain on the yet-to-be-concluded vote counting in the U.S. election. The Nigerian stock index was slightly up 0.03%. The JSC index in South Africa continues to work strong, trading up 2.52% at intraday. EGX30 in Egypt was up 0.07%. Kenya closed to negative on Wednesday. And the story was the same in the Gulf region with Qatar leading the pack of gainers. The index was up 1.67%. Saudi Arabia's main index was the lone loser, down 0.26%. In the UAE, it was all green. Abu Dhabi was up 0.60%, while Dubai was up 0.32%. And in Europe, stocks advanced in the morning as election uncertainty continues in the U.S. There are also news headlines getting investors' attention. Let's get details from Conrad. Hello, Conrad. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Good afternoon, Chibi. Thanks for having me back again on Channels TV. Right, so attention on the markets in Europe is shifting again from the U.S. election to the European economy and business activity. German factory orders have been updated and the Bank of England has announced it will increase its bond purchases. What's the impact on trading? Well, Chibi, I have to say, of course, the U.S. election is still sort of uh, being talked about on the trading floor. It's also having a positive influence on the German DAX, which after a 2% increase yesterday is gaining a little bit more. You know, uh, with uh, the perspective at the moment that the Democrats don't uh, have the full power in the future as they probably won't get the majority in the Senate, uh, this has caused speculation that uh, probably uh, the new administration will not be able to take back all of the tax cuts that the Trump administration introduced, and this is a good sign for stocks. Of course, the Bank of England's announcement of doing more uh, monetary uh, policy stimulus uh, just illustrates how difficult the situation, in particular in the UK, is. You know, uh, the country is not only going through a relatively strict lockdown, but of course, it's also facing Brexit. Uh, German factory orders, they have continued to increase uh, in the month of the September, which is a positive indicator for what to expect uh, for the manufacturing sector in this current fourth quarter. More, uh, you know, uh, orders, uh, more jobs to be done. Uh, that gives hope that the manufacturing sector can go through this current quarter where we are seeing a light lockdown or a partial lockdown here in Germany that, uh, you know, the manufacturers can go, get through this quarter a bit better than uh, uh, during the spring months when we saw the first stricter lockdown here in Germany. And let's look at the earnings there. Germany's Commerce Bank, Lufthansa and a few smaller German engineering firms have come out with earnings reports. What story are they telling? Jimmy, they are telling a story of uh, very difficult times for the services sector and slightly less difficult for some of the manufacturers. Uh, Lufthansa has reported a larger loss for the third quarter than analysts had anticipated. It's also warning that it's burning more cash or cash more quickly than it uh, was the case up until now. Commerzbank has more than doubled its risk provisions, which means that uh, Commerzbank is getting prepared for a lot of uh, loans turning bad. And that, of course, is connected to the corona recession. Commerzbank also says that now it expects this year to be ending with a loss. So 
This illustrates how hard hit the services sector, travel sector, parts of the banking sector are. On the other hand, machinery and engineering firms, uh, uh, a few smaller ones today, Dürr and Gea reported slightly better numbers than analysts had anticipated, also due to rigorous cost cutting. The firms are not yet where they were before the pandemic uh, hit this spring, but their situation is much better uh, generally speaking, than the ones for the uh, services sector. Could be so from cryptocurrency. Bitcoin has climbed on the highest level in more than two years. Any connection to the U.S. election there? Well, of course, everything around Bitcoin is very secretive, so it's very speculative. Uh, to talk about it, uh, I, I can only get uh, second-hand information by experts who run around here at the exchange and who are telling me what they think. And some of those uh, experts say that, yes, there's a connection, uh, you know, the uncertainty about what to expect in the United States in the coming months and even years is, uh, you know, a bit of a negative factor for the U.S. dollar, and that is giving crypto uh, a bit you know, more confidence by some investors. Other investors uh, are saying, well, uh, you know, there is no vote of no confidence for the US dollar here. It's just that uh, what's happening in tech stocks is very closely connected to uh, what's going on with the cryptocurrency. And as, you know, uh, immediately after the election in the US was over, in particular, tech stocks were in demand again. Also, cryptocurrencies are up. It's basically the same kind of investors going for those assets. Thank you very much uh, for your time there, Conrad. Enjoy the rest of the day. And in the UK, the Bank of England is predicting that the economy will suffer a much deeper COVID-19 recession uh, than the US or the Eurozone. Let's hear more from Juliana. Hello, Juliana. Good afternoon. Well, today's Bank of England forecast looks like um, the hopes of a V-shaped recovery have fizzled out. You will recall the BOE chief economist Ander Heldin said uh, some time ago the recovery uh, looked to be so far so V, uh, with economic growth rebounding faster than expected. Yes, absolutely. Uh, that uh, hope for a V-shaped recovery uh, went quite a while ago, uh, particularly as in August we started seeing uh, that growth was slowing down, even though it was summer, even though there were less restrictions. And we even had that uh, pretty successful eat out to help out scheme where 100 million meals uh, were eaten during that month on a 50% discount. But I've got to tell you, uh, Jimmy, we actually have a bit of breaking news here in the UK. Just before I came into the studio, I caught the tail end of Chancellor Rishi Shunak speaking in front of lawmakers in the House of Commons. And because of that pretty abysmal downgrade by the Bank of England's Monetary Policy Committee in their quarterly November report, uh, the Chancellor has actually decided to extend the furlough scheme. So that job retention subsidy scheme that's cost the British taxpayer about £40 billion since it started in March will now be extended into March 2020. This is a huge a story um, is going to uh, greatly affect uh, millions and millions of people that are living up and down the UK that have worried um, so much about their jobs. I know, Chimaze, you've been one of the people that have been asking countless times if it's going to be extended. I always keep saying no, but alas, at the last minute, the government have done another U-turn. They've done about 20 U-turns since this pandemic has started. That this has probably got to be the biggest. Um, Andrew Bailey, the Bank of England governor, was speaking on uh, various British media stations, trying to get uh, some airtime in between um, all of the election turmoil that's going on stateside. But he said, you know, there is a double threat to the British economy. Um, he's downgrading the projections of the economy is expected to contract between 10 and 11 percent on top with what the Paris-based uh, think tank, the OECD, suggests. And because of that, uh, once again, uh, Chancellor Rishi Shunak has stood up in the House of Commons and said that the job retention scheme, the furlough scheme, will be extended until March 2021. Hmm. Well, that's um, good news coming from um, the Chancellor. In the meantime, of course, the Bank of England, of course, is planning to pump an extra £150 billion into the economy. And then with this um, Chancellor's decision now, uh, I guess that could help. 
Well, you know, they're, they're trying to do whatever they can, um, really. Like I said, Andrew Bailey didn't mince his words. I've got a quote from him. He said, now uh, we think there'll be a further downturn in the fourth quarter, the golden quarter, uh, the quarter where Britain are basically in a lockdown. So I think it's quite likely that the economy will end this year probably around 10 to 11 percent below where it was in terms of activity in the last year. And that is historically unprecedented. Uh, what do the MPC uh, are trying to do, which is why they pump this 150 billion into the economy um, is they're trying to get the wheels turning. The, the wheels have effectively ground to a halt in Britain. Um, and so the 100 billion pounds quantitative easing program will run out this year. That's the one they've currently got in place. And so from January 2021, this new 150 billion will pump uh, some stimulus into the economy. Um, at the moment, um, unemployment stands at about 4.5% uh, from uh, the MPC's uh, minutes. Uh, we can see that they predict um, unemployment here in the UK will rise to about 7.5% by the end of the year. It will peak in Q1 next year, and then we're expecting it to gradually decline. Uh, but I've got to tell you, this really is an unprecedented time in Britain uh, because the government know just how much uh, these um, economic stimulus packages will eventually cost uh, Britain and cost the UK. But I, I think the stark warning that we received from Andrew Bailey, not just just about COVID-19, but also about Brexit, which is eight weeks away, um, it, it was going to do some catastrophic damage. And so to keep people afloat, to keep people's lights on, to keep money in people's pockets so they can eat, uh, the government have decided to extend uh, this scheme, which at its peak was helping 9.5 million people. Mm. All right, let's take a peep into the market, how the market's reacting to all of these, the BOE statements, the Chancellor's statement, and of course, the uncertainty around the U.S. election. Well, there are some solid gains on the FTSE at intraday. Of course, uh, that £150 billion, uh, definitely um, cheered up investors. The all share is up 0.52%. The FTSE 100 is up by 0.56%. And the FTSE 250 is up by half a percent. In currencies, the British pound also up on the US dollar by 0.51% down on the euro by 0.13% and up on the Japanese yen by 0.20%. I'll very quickly say, uh, Chimase, we did have um, some data uh, from the UK PMI, which has a look at how healthy the private sector is doing in construction. Um, it has actually fallen to 53.1 in October from 56.8. Still above that 50, but we can see that uh, the economic gains in the country are slowly fading. Hmm. We are watching. Enjoy the rest of the day, Juliana. And stocks in Asia Pacific were higher today as investors continue to wait for the result of the U.S. election. Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index led gains among the region's major markets as it surged 2.72%. In Japan, the Nikkei 225 advanced 1.26%, while the Topics Index traded 0.98% higher. Mainland Chinese stocks were also higher, with the Shanghai Composite up 0.88%. The Shenzhen Component advanced 1.167%. Meanwhile, shares in Australia rose rose with the S&P ASS 200 gaining 1.232%. MSCSI's broadest index of Asia's Pacific shares outside Japan rose 1.76%. And the U.S. stock index futures were higher in early morning trade on Thursday as investors um, hoped that the winner of the U.S. presidential election would soon be determined. Futures contracts tied to the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose 188 points, S&P 500 futures and Nasdaq 100 futures both also traded in positive territory. Even with the president-elect on Claire, stocks rose broadly during Wednesday's trading session as hopes for a blue wave in the Congress dwindled which some argued would have been a headwind for areas of the market, including big tech. However, some strategists noted that a contested election, which is not off the table at this point, could lead to a sharp drop in stocks over the short term. Senate Majority Leader said on Wednesday that the passing further stimulus will be the chamber's top priority when it reconvenes, although analysts warn that without a blue wave, the package will be smaller than the $3 trillion dollar Democrats had been looking for. We'll take a break and when we come back we do more from the African continent. Do stay with us.
The cleanup of a massive oil spill in August from a vessel off Mauritius will likely be mostly completed by January. This is according to the bulk carrier owner Japan's Ngashik shipping. Of the roughly 1,000 tons that spilled from the Panamanian flagged MV Wakashio, all of the oil that had been floating in the ocean had been recovered. The spilled oil had spread over a vast area of endangered corals, affecting fish and other marine life in what some scientists have called the Indian Ocean Islands' worst ecological disaster. And Global Wind Energy Council says wind energy will achieve record growth globally over the next five years as the impact of COVID-19 has only been to delay, not cancel projects. The Trade Association says in total, some 348 gigawatts of new onshore and offshore capacity are expected by the end of 2024, which will take cumulative wind power capacity to almost 1,000 gigawatts. The costs of wind energy have fallen rapidly over the last few years and are expected to continue to decrease governments are also under pressure to cut carbon emissions which is helping to shift investment away from fossil fuel and into renewable energy such as wind. Okay, the air of Christmas is already blowing and part of what comes to mind during the Christmas celebration is the food we eat and mainly it is rice and Domestic Commodities Market updates today. We will be talking rice with Mayowa Ige, one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company. Hello, Mayowa. Good afternoon. Good to see you. Hello. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Now, in a bid to encourage local production of rice and boost self-sufficiency, Nigeria which is the largest producer of rice in Africa, shut down her land borders that was last year and placed restriction on rice importation. Now, the federal government again launched initiatives such as the Anchor Borrowers programs with a view of increasing agricultural output of commodities such as rice. Despite these, the price of rice has increased by an estimated 70% over the period. What do you think is responsible for this? So um, since the um, border closure and the restriction and importation of rice, we have actually seen an increase in our local production of rice. However, this increase in production hasn't been enough to satisfy the local demand of rice, which has led to a supply deficit. This supply deficit is the reason for the increase in the production of rice. And then also, there's the production challenges that limit how the price of locally produced rice can be. Some of these challenges um, include low mechanization. Most farmers use manual labor. And then you have um, issues such as difficulty in assessing agro inputs. And there are also stru structural um, problems in relation to irrigation facilities, um, processing and storage facilities, and uh, as well as roads. Now, the government of Cameroon announced that it seized about 332,300 metric tons of rice illegally being expected, exported into Nigeria uh, last year, uh, despite the country's need to import the commodity to meet demand. Do you think uh, this was in retaliation to Nigeria's border closure? And did this really have any impact on the supply and price of rice in the country? So, um... I don't think it's a retaliation because the, our borders have already been closed. And so whether the Cameroonian government or the Nigerian government, those goods were being exported illegally. And so one of the people has um, seized it anyways. And so I, I, I don't think it was a retaliation. On the impact on um, supply, well, if you said having 330 million, um, metric tons of rice in circulation would have increased our supply of rice, and that would have affected prices, reducing prices. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, rice is a widely consumed uh, staple across the country and is not only a daily meal but also a ceremonial meal. So with the festive season approaching and border closure still in place, do you think the current price movement of the commodity will change and how will it affect the demand for price uh, during this period? Typically, um, the price of rice increases during the festive season. And so um, I don't think that, I think that the price of rice will continue to trend upwards in this season. And also the reduction in supply of rice um, due to the floods in Kebi State that destroyed about 
sent over expected harvest this year will also support this price movement. On the demand for it, due to the COVID pandemic, we saw that quite a number of people lost jobs, a lot of people um, had pay cuts, and this has affected the level of disposable income in the country. And so this will affect the demand for the product in, even in this first season. And so demand will most likely not be as high as we saw last year or the year before. I think that the demand may be similar to what we saw in 2016 during the recession. All right, thanks uh, for your time, uh, Moyewa Ige. Moyewa Ige is one of the research analysts with Financial Derivatives Company. All right, let's look at the global commodities scene, starting off with oil. Uh, prices dropped this morning as Democrat Joe Biden edged closer to the White House in a nail-biting U.S. presidential election, but the Republicans look likely to retain Senate control, decreasing the chances of any huge COVID-19 relief package. U.S. West Texas intermediate crude futures fell 64 cents to $38.51 a barrel, while Brent crude futures dropped 68 cents to $40.55 a barrel. Both contracts had jumped around 4% on Wednesday. All prices had surged on Wednesday on growing expectations that the organization of the petroleum exporting countries and its allies, together called OPEC Plus, would hold off on bringing back 2 million barrels per day of supply in January, given demand has been sapped by new COVID-19 lockdowns. And on metal markets, gold prices were a little chained today after early U.S. election results suggested a lead for Democrat contender Joe Biden, even as the possibility of a contested result remained. Spot gold was little chained at $1,904 an ounce. U.S. gold futures rose 0.5% to $1,905.50 per ounce. In other metals, silver rose 0.3% to $23.98. Platinum was steady at at $869.04, while palladium fell 0.5% to $2,276. And with that, we wrap up today's edition of the program. Thank you for watching. I'm Chimezi Obi Iwago.